hope to I hope to um, uh, navigate the space somewhere between this rather dry title and the amazingly super duper sexy title on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we'll be somewhere in the middle. Just before I start, I want to ask the students here, how many of you have taken English 270? Lots of you. Excellent. Because this course, for, this course, this, uh, this lecture uh, sort of uses the English 270 as a focal point for the discussion. So hopefully it will resonate with you. If you have any questions that need clarification, like if I'm saying something that just doesn't make sense, I would be happy to answer in the middle. If you have like big questions, say them to the end. Okay. Um, so I want to start off today with sort of figuring out a space between the economy and uh, language instruction, like how we teach language at, at college. So the first quote I want to start off with is this one. Without hyperbole, one could say that in 1992, US education became a service industry, and its first congressionally sponsored marketing report told educators to give the customers what they want, good employees saleable to service industry employees. So there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, the customers for your education is not you. It's, uh, it's the, the bosses, the businesses, who are going to be the employers of the students. So this already sort of should get you thinking that uh, we're starting off with a place of enormous pressure on the curriculum at, uh, at our institutions to satisfy this demand, especially because Congress sort of found that this is what education should be doing. It should be providing people, employees who fit in, who can be good workers in this economy. The second thing I want to, the second idea I want to introduce is the idea of linguistic capital from Pierre Bourdieu. So this one says, Linguistic, I left some bits out, this is one and French. Um, <laughs> linguistic exchange is an economic exchange which is established within a prior symbolic relation of power between a producer endowed with a certain linguistic capital and a consumer or a market which is capable of procuring a certain material or symbolic profit. So language isn't just about communication of ideas, it's an expression of power. And discourse is an expression of a power relation. So discourse as in language that happens between two people or several people. So everything that you say and the way that you say it is imbued with some kind of, of, of value that goes beyond just what it expresses. It also is valued for what it tells about you and about what you think of the person you're talking to and the person you're speaking or writing for. So there's a lot going on in this relationship that I want to sort of dig into a little bit today. So just to give some context for what I'm going to talk about today, the, the starting point, point of this project was um, York College's English 270 class. This class is called Introduction to Grammar and Syntax, and it's in, an introductory grammar course. Uh, it's a little bit notorious because <laughs> um, it's, it's quite an intense course and it introduces students to the kind of work that they haven't necessarily done before. This intense focus on the details of language, not necessarily even what it means, but how sentences are put together and how, in some senses, how they appear to their audience. So it's, um, audience is always a big thing in English 270. So it's a notorious course, it's also quite popular. We have four sections during the regular academic year, plus one in summer and usually one in winter, though last winter there wasn't much, which was, I was very shocked by, so it's popular. It also um, fulfills a graduation requirement in that it is writing intensive. So this sort of gives an idea that not all students taking English 270 are drawn to the course because they are fascinated with grammar. It, um, it's a requirement for the journalism program. It's a requirement for uh, certain students in English ed, um, in teacher ed as well. So it's fulfilling a number of needs on campus. It, it's, uh, it's a graduation requirement and it's also a major requirement. So a lot of the students in the classes aren't there. Uh, I'll back up a bit. The course was originally conceived. I asked um, the person who designed the course, Carolyn Kirkpatrick, um, what the course was for. And she said, oh, it was to, to um, explore gra grammar as a liberal art, like understanding grammar for grammar's sake. So the fact that it's designed for this purpose, and yet the students are in the class looking for something quite different, either just to fulfill a requirement, or, 
or to fulfill a requirement suggests there's going to be some tension between what the course was designed to do and what students want to get out of the course. So having taught the course for a number of times, I thought, oh, there's going to be some tension. So I asked, this, I asked students last year um, in all four sections taught during the regular school year about what, like, how they identify themselves linguistically, um, what their expectations were in taking the course, what their motivations were, so what they thought they'd get and why they were taking it, and how they thought their course would benefit them at York, at work, and elsewhere. So I was asking students particularly about what, why, they were, why they were in that classroom. I'm not going to go into too many details of the, of the motivations, though if anyone wants to know, I can speak at length on that topic. But I'm going to focus more on the, um, on the first two parts of the questionnaire, the um, linguistic identity, because that informs a lot of what we do in the classroom, in, as I'm going to argue here, and also <coughs> students' expectations of the course, like what they thought the course was going to do for them. So that's what I'll be focusing on today. So what I'm going to argue today is that English 270 and grammar like them, oops, subject verb agreement, no, antecedent agreement problem. So English 270 and grammar classes like English 270 can plug into this connection that I was mentioning before, that there's a really strong connection between higher education and the service industry, where students are working in the service, um, our students in particular are working in uh, in the service industry, they're facing customers, they're dealing with a, with a specific audience, either in terms of customers or in terms of people they're caring for, or in terms of bosses who want things to be a certain way. So the students taking the course see a really direct connection between what they learn in the class and their employment and careers. Um, that is, English 270 is, oh, or, and it, wait, I'm expanding this eventually. Like the grammar course is fulfilling a function of, of improvement to take students from where they are linguistically and take them somewhere that's sort of more marketable, if you like, that's, you know, to put it colloquially, shinier and more polished. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that means to be more polished and more professional. So that's the first, the first connection that I want to make. The second one is to take, instead of taking the um, perspective of, from the students, to look at it from a teacher's perspective. That because it has this real word, world application, and because it's very explicit in the real world application, at least in what I hear from the students, we have different responsibilities as instructors. When, if you're teaching an English course, your responsibility is to you know, get students immersed in English literature or in English language. Like There's a very disciplinary focus, and that's what we've been doing. In English 298, we've really been sort of getting into the details of looking at world English or looking at sociolinguistics or something like that. In the grammar course, we, the, the thought of an audience for a product is more important, it's more explicit. So when I'm teaching it, at least I, I'm very conscious of the fact that the students in the class are looking at this class to do something to the language that goes out into the world. So that, I think, at, at least creates a different kind of responsibility when we're teaching. And I'm going to talk more about sort of how to fulfill that responsibility. So, and to tie it back to the Bourdieu quote that I gave in the beginning, students see um, grammar courses as a mean of, means of increasing linguistic capital. And a number of the responses to the survey that I got said that students, although they were taking the course to, to um, to fulfill a requirement, we're looking for improvement. They were looking for a change from what they could do grammatically at the beginning of the course and what they could do at the end of the course. So there was a specific expectation that the course was going to like move them along a spectrum. And it wasn't exactly clear what that spectrum looked like, but there was definitely an expectation of, of, of change. Um, but that suggests that students enter the course, they come in there thinking, automatically that they're entering from a place of linguistic deficit, that there are certain things that they can't do, that they're not good at, good at doing, um, specifically in terms of, of grammar. And you know, as, as the poster sort of suggests, we, we already have a lot of expectations of what grammar is. Um, it's correct, it's proper, it's good, it's uh, formal, it's these kind of things. So it's sort of this separate thing from what we do elsewhere when we just talk and write, like grammar adds this veneer of 
respectability, if you like. If your grammar is good, you're more respectable. Um, and people who, in class we've talked about, uh, when you're in your, in your elementary school classes, there's a real pressure to, to speak properly and talk properly because it does, it adds authority and it adds respectability. So, but I'm concerned about this sort of, as a linguist, this place of uh, imagining of deficit as a starting point. So I'm going to talk a bit about how we can reconceive what we do, what we think about the about, about grammar instruction as, as sort of moving students from thinking about themselves being at a place of deficit to thinking, oh, I have all sorts of linguistic resources available to me. How can I, uh, how can I use them? How can I exploit them? If you like. Okay. So to do this, to do this thinking, I'm going to talk about this concept of my notes here. Um, I'm going to use a concept of what's called imagined communities. So an imagined community is a community that, that people imagine themselves belonging to. So it's not, um, it's not rooted in everyday practice. It's not, you, don't, you don't meet your, your community members in the imagined community. In fact, you can't. Um, so you imagine you're affiliated with this. And the example that the sort of author of this idea, Benedict Anderson, used was a nation. To say, if you if you identify as a member of a nation, um, that's an imagined community because you're not going to meet everyone else, and yet you say, yes, we are all Americans, or yes, we are all Australians, or something like that. So there's a lot of imagination behind constructing that community, and that sort of replaces day-to-day -day interactions that you get in other kinds of communities. So I'm going to use this um, use this concept of imagined communities to talk a bit about what I think the grammar course is doing from a student's perspective, from an instructor perspective, and from a shared perspective, but not in that order. So I'm going to look at the, uh, the shared perspective first. So this is just a, um, a, a little bit more of an explanation, sort of linking back to the theme here, that um, I'm going to suggest that the way we teach our grammar courses helps students define their imagined community. <coughs> um, so it either limits the ways in which they imagine themselves participating in the world, or it opens up possibilities. So if you teach a grammar course really prescript prescriptively, saying, here are the rules, we're going to study the rules for 14 weeks and be very like, and this is correct and this is incorrect, and focus really on a, a narrow definition of language, I'm suggesting that you actually limit the way students can imagine themselves um, participating in the world. Because if you're establishing correct languages occupying just a really small space, then A, it's really hard to attain, and B, and B it's easy to make mistakes. And C, if, you, if students can't fit themselves into that narrow space, then they feel like they've failed. Whereas if we open up a bigger space that students can imagine themselves participating in linguistically, and, and I, I'm going to argue that the grammar course is a good place for us to, to do this, then they can actually participate in a wider spectrum of, um, of, of linguistic contexts. And they can use what they're already coming with and adapt it to a new context, rather than imagining only that there's a target up here, they're starting from down here, and they have to navigate this space. So one of the things that I suggest that we can do in grammar courses is help students imagine what they can be linguistically, how they can wield, and how they can construct, and how they can perform their linguistic capital. Okay, so let's back up a bit. I started sort of talking at the beginning about, about linguistic identity and how I'd ask students about what their linguistic identity was. And what I found when I asked that uh, was quite interesting. So I ask questions about, are you, do you consider yourself a native speaker of standard American English? Do you consider yourself a native speaker of standard American English and some other English? Do you consider yourself a native speaker of standard American English and another language? Or are you a native speaker of um, another language? Um, and I'm just going to skip forward and then come back. This is what I found, that fully 40, 43 out of 80 of the students said that they were native speakers only of standard American English. 
that's, uh, and so that's over 50% of the class. That 16% of the class said they spoke um, uh, English, standard American English natively, and another language, which was often Spanish, but there were some other languages in there as well. Um, uh, 11% of the students were native speakers of Standard American English and another English. So, I am not a native speaker of Standard American English, but I am a speaker of another English. But there's lots of students, and we talk about this in our class, that students here switch between the Standard and um, some other kind of intermediate and uh, all sorts of things. And then there was 15% of the students who would consider themselves native speakers only of um, uh, uh, languages other than English. So what I'd like to draw attention to here is this big number of pointers. Let's see if I can make Aha. That's huge to say that 54% of students in this class, this linguistically, ethnically, racially diverse co college, are exclusively speakers of standard American English. And I bet that if you asked a lot of professors, are half of your class native speakers of standard American English, they would say no. So there's this interesting space between the identity that students are claiming for themselves and the identity that might be imposed on them. So I was interested in this space between it and trying to think where could it be coming from. So, um, get back to the idea of imagined communities. If you claim an identity as a native speaker of standard English in this country, you're claiming an affiliation with the linguistically dominant community. So if you say, I am a native speaker of standard American English, you're saying, I belong to the powerful community that speaks standard American English. So this is a powerful gesture of affiliation. It's saying, if I, if I claim that like, linguistic identity, I belong to that community. So from that perspective, from students who are at college to move ahead economically, socially, all sorts of things like that, it makes perfect sense to make this claim. To say, I belong to that group, I have the power that that group has. Um, it's also, it gives, it gives us a little bit of pause because it shows that this concept of native speaker, which we hold on to so tightly in education, like we divide students by whether they're native speakers of English, we test them, we place them, we do all sorts of things, that it's not as easy as just saying, well, this person is a native speaker and this person isn't, because people have their own opinions about their, whether they're a native speaker or something. Um, we talked about this a little bit in class, and there's some students in my class who sound like native speakers to me, but didn't identify as such. So it goes the other way as well. Like some people claim native speaker identity when, you know, as Sean Del Nero says, running the tape suggests otherwise. <laughs> um, and some people don't claim native speaker identity when running the tape would suggest that they certainly could and not have an argument. So it so sort of shows that this concept of native speaker is certainly an amorphous one. It changes shape depending on who you're looking at and how you're looking at them. Um, and it's really as much about a perception as about ling actual linguistic expertise. So, let me go back. Yes, I want to sort of focus on this term up the top, this idealized native speaker. This isn't my term, this is from Ben Harris, Connie Lung, and Roxy Hampton. I think I got that right. No, Harris, Lung, right. Um, that they're saying that this, the concept of a native speaker isn't a real concept. It's not. It's a. It's a shifting target. What we think of, what's written about extensively in the literature, even what we use to place students into classes, is an idealized version of this native speaker that has a lot more to do with perception from the outside than it does with what if affiliate, linguistic affiliation the speaker claims, what heritage, what linguistic heritage they have, and their actual expertise. So actually asking students how they identify sort of turns this on people's head, but we see that students are sort of tapping into this, this idea of the ideal and native speaker as being a site of linguistic capital, a site of linguistic power. So it 
goes further than this, though. Students are often included or excluded from the native speaker community by their instructors and by their employ employers. So, and again, this is regardless of their actual expertise. How many of you have had the experience of, of having, I have an accent like that people think it sounds posh, but <laughs> if you have an accent that isn't considered posh and you say something to someone, even though you're speaking exactly the same form of sentences as the person you're talking to because you have a different accent, well, what did you say? Like, and so there's this automatic, almost suspicion like, you're not a real speaker of English because you sound different. And, you know, I think, I don't know if you've gotten to accent in sociolinguistics, but accent has very little to do with actual, you know, syntactic competence. And from my own personal experience, it's really hard to get rid of. I mean, you can lose, you can lose all, I can speak in perfect American English sentences. No one notices. Because they just hear my accent. So, so there's, we spend a lot of time imposing categories on people rather than saying, oh, how do you identify yourself? I have to identify as an Australian English speaker, but partially because there's no point doing otherwise, and partially because it's actually an identity that's sort of helpful to me. But other people make different decisions. And I, I mentioned this before. On the other hand, students and people more generally, claim native or non-native speaker status regardless of this objective expertise. And by objective, you know, you get a panel of experts to say, is this a, this is a number of studies that have been done. Is this person a native speaker? Is this person a native speaker? And a panel of experts will say yes or no. So people spend time doing this. So what do we make of that? So this is just to recap what I said in the discussion, that this claim of a linguistic identity of saying, yes, I'm a native speaker for the students in these classes, is saying it's a claim of community membership. It's sort of a, saying, I belong to a more powerful linguistic community, which is interesting when thinking about the broader perspective of students coming to English 270 saying, I need help, I need to improve. And yet, when you say, what kind of language user are you, uh, more than half say, I'm a native speaker, which sort of comes with some expertise sort of built in. So, it's just some more details to that. What it also suggests is that a successful, a powerful English speaker is someone who can't be identified with any particular linguistic context. So, I mean, there's an idea that says, um, if I can tell that you're from Hollis, I, you're, I'm going to give you less respect than if I can tell from your accent that you come from, I don't know, West, West Side. Like, upper, nice. upper West Side. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Upper West Side. I live in New Jersey, so I'm like, oh, where, where, where am I going with this? Um, so uh, a lot of the, the, the goal uh, for grandma instruction, if we're not careful, can be taking away the local taint, if you like, making people sound like they don't come from anywhere in particular. And certainly if we think of um, people working in a global economy, which is sort of the big picture here, or to people doing language work to be able to fit into this bigger service economy, which really is global. It's like the, the company that you work for is probably situated not particularly locally, um, the person who, the, the idea is the person who's going to succeed is the person who is not recognizable from being anywhere in particular. And if you think about like the, the notorious phone banks in India uh, for all the, the service support for your computer, like the people who are more successful representatives are the ones who don't sound like they're sitting in Bangalore. Um, they're the ones who make people feel more comfortable because they sound like they're not from any, they're more not from anywhere in particular. So there's this push to that the good grammar and good English doesn't come from anywhere in particular, except perhaps, you know, somewhere near where the Queen lives or something. Um, that's okay if you sound like that, but most people don't. So, so you're trying to decontextualize and shift into this other community. So claiming membership in the community gives access to that community. Like the actual act of saying I belong really gets you a long way in the So why not say you belong? There's nothing to 
lives. Um, but, as I hope I've sort of suggested, this community is both imagined and idealized. It doesn't necessarily exist, so once again, it's this elusive target. Um, and just to give sort of a bit more background to this, I want to introduce this idea, which is from the um, English is a English is a lingua franca literature. So there's a lot of literature out there that says English is becoming the global language. We've been talking about this a little bit. And it's a language that's spoken a lot by, um, uh, by non-native speakers. So people who have learned the language at school and use it in an everyday capacity, but their, lang their home languages are something else. So this, is, this quotation, I'll read it suggests that where the language is going doesn't care that much about natives being a native speaker anyway, which makes it So if we follow Moriano's argument regarding English as an international language, we may even claim that non-native speakers of English are more communicative than efficient speakers of English in international contexts than a great deal of native speakers, especially those who speak fairly local or sub substandard varieties of the language and whose language is hardly intelligible for speakers of other varieties of English. So first of all, after you go about the substandard, so everyone in sociolinguistics and should have thought about substandard. <laughs> um, this is sort of a, a disquieting concept that perhaps what we should be looking at isn't this perfection, native speaker proficiency, but rather this being communicatively efficient. And being communicatively efficient means you're very aware of context. So it pushes you away from this decontextualized de language and says, what am I trying to do? Who am I writing for? Who am I speaking for? So that's this suggests sort of a way forward and something that as a grammar instructor and as someone who's focusing on the technicality of language, I need to be aware of that what I need to ask my students to do is not to be perfect, but to be functional, to be communicatively efficient rather than correct, super correct, native speaker-like. Okay. So that's sort of a shared perspective, this problem, I guess of uh, this idealized native speaker. What I want to shift to now is the more student's perspective. So I'm going back to the, to the survey that I did in English 270 where I asked, what do you think you're going to get out of this? And so I'm going to talk from um, the perspective of the student-built imagined community, what students think English 270 is going to do for them. So I asked the students what they thought they were going to get out of it. And what I found was they think that the grammar class is going to connect school and work. So they said things like this. Employers want speakers who, who what, employers want people who speak and write in proper form. The grammar that is used in the classroom vibes with times when you need to be professional. English 270 will sharpen writing skills and conversational skills, thereby enhancing my professional image and attributes. Many employers in the job market can be huge sticklers for correct grammar. So those of you who've taken the class already, does that sort of sound familiar? Is that something that you thought you might get at the beginning? Something that sort of the grammar will be correct, that and it will be something that could enhance your professional image and attributes? Like, did you think about the professional aspects of the class when you were taking it? Yeah, to shame. Oh, okay. Like, oh, good. Something's happening out there. So this is a this is a uh, a vision of a course that's going to do something very specific. That's going to really uh, give students a leg up, if you like, into this competitive linguistic world of, of uh, business. And I actually asked the students what their jobs are. And there's a lot of retail, elder care, child care, secretarial, that kind of thing. So it really is dealing with people a lot, and lots of very. Um, uh, Specific context-specific writing being done, like lots of businessy kind of communications. So something quite the, the writing that they're expecting at um, work is and need help with, I guess, at work is quite different from what they're getting in lots of other classes at the college. Okay, so this imagined community I'm calling the professional knowledge worker. Remember, worker. 
Um, so the world outside school that the students are striving to attain is adult and professional. And these are words that came up again and again, that they want language, that want to learn a language that is adult, that sounds adult, and that is professional. So it contrasts with what um, Rosalind Miller called the pre-sexual, pre-economic, and pre-political composition classroom, um, where, uh, where you know, there's, there's a, perhaps a perception that what you're doing in composition in, in English 125 and English 126 doesn't connect to who you are in the world. It's very specific to academic writing. And so that was one sort of interpretation. And then also, uh, students wrote things like, well, after I've taken this course, of course, I won't sound like a child, which I thought was actually a little disturbing, that there's this sort of, that the language that you speak at home is childish, and when you get to this more formal, more correct language, that's only then will you be perceived linguistically as an adult. So, but it was sort of, that was sort of like, that's fascinating, oh my goodness, kind of thing. So there's this is real contrast between the adult world of work and the childish world of home. So very, very much a separation between the two. So once again, there's a perception that the language used outside school and work is somehow deficient. It doesn't do grown-up things. So you know, just as there is an idealized, idealized native speaker, I want to suggest there's an idealized professional speaker as well, like this professional speaker who is a, 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 a you, you have to imagine it, especially when you're just starting out in work, you don't know. And there's actually books about this that say it's only when you're writing in context in your job that you really learn how to write for your job. So what we're trying to do at school, at least in the courses that have sort of more professional focus, is help students imagine that. But again, we're making the target artificially small, I would say, when, and of course it's easier to teach, we, can, we only have 14 weeks, you only have 14 weeks, like, there's only so much you can do, but what I want to sort of get us thinking about is what can we do in 14 weeks, maybe we can do more. So once again, that we, we also come back to this idea that decontextualizing language is a successful strategy, saying if I take myself away from my home context, and my home linguistic context, I will become adult, I will become professional. I will be able to move into a different rank of my professional life. So that's sort of the background that I wanted to extensively set up. We've got, on one hand, the linguistic identity, which we're dealing with in in classes in general, but in um, English 270 in particular, and also this professional identity, which is very much present. One of the courses that, or one of the majors that requires English 270 is journalism. So a lot of our students in the class are journalism majors. And they, so they have very specific linguistic needs that they are, feel free, very free to express in the class, <laughs> as you know. Um, so this sort of thing. There's more of an awareness of this application of this linguistic work in English 270 than there is in any of the other classes. So, got me thinking. Okay. So, what does this mean from a pedagogical and philosophical perspective? So, I'm suggesting that this grammar course, a grammar course for English 270, not just English 270, though. I'm not talking very much about other ones, but that's the broader scope of this project. It's potentially really quite dangerous space, and it's funny to use the word dangerous in school, because it's actually a very safe space in many ways, but it has the real potential to compromise our students. Because it's really easy, when you've got a course called grammar, to suppress alternative discourses, to say, we just have one target. Um, and it's really easy to prioritize the demands of the marketplace. This is what students say they want. I want to write professionally. I want to be a good journalist. I'm just, I, there's lots of journalists in the class, sorry, this isn't just a journalist. Um, but I, wa I want this thing, so it's very easy to meet the demands of the students to say, okay, I will teach you to write beautiful, correct sentences. Um, but doing this is really problematic. Um, 
so I'm introducing this new term of monolingualizing ped pedagogy. There's a real danger in this course that we teach only one, that there is only one acceptable language. Um, and only one acceptable English. And for all of you in sociolinguistics and uh, world Englishes, we know by now that there are lots and lots of varieties that at least need some space to be considered. So teaching with this marketplace uh, orientation or with this correctness orientation sort of feeds into this thing saying there's only one acceptable language. And it sort of says also that in the elite, everyone has to be the same. If you're going to be economically elite uh, and powerful in that way, you have to conform to a very narrow version of the language. Um, so this term, again, sort of conformity isn't mine. It's mining holders, and it contrasts with this thing, super diversity, which people have said sort of when you're in a place like New York City, you, you encounter this thing, super diversity. It's not just sort of regular diversity, but it's so concentrated that you get really like, amazing variation among, along all sorts of spectrum. But it's often, you often see super diversity at the lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, and the argument is, as you go up the socioeconomic spectrum, you get super conformity. Like everyone's the same, and everyone wants to be the same. So it's like this squishing traffic goal. So teaching for that model really restricts what students are able to do. Because if you're imagining that you can only do one sort of thing linguistically, when you're asked to do something different, which you will be, it's going to be very hard to adapt. So, and the other sort of problem is that when you teach, like, like all different languages are great. It's like seems so bubble-headed and naive. Um, and it also creates a lot of resistance among students. They know I don't want that. So we've got this sort of uh, uh, again a lot of tension between the demands from the students and the demands from the, even the title of the course and what's actually useful um, to teach as a you know as a person in the world. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion of an alternative imagined community that we can use. And this is, again, this is sort of specific, I'm specifically talking about the grammar courses, but I think it applies whenever we're teaching writing, whenever we're teaching something language focused, just to think differently about what the target is. So, imagined community number three. First thing is, we can create a space where linguistic versatility, so not necessarily diversity, and for its own sake, but linguistic versatility is valued. So making the barrier between professional language and personal language or adult language and child language or whatever you like is more porous. Like they have something to say to each other rather than saying we do this, we have these linguistic practices over here, we have these linguistic practices over here, and they don't have anything to do with each other. We can go back to the idea of saying correctness is less important than communicative efficiency. I thought I'd get in trouble for saying that. But We've got, to we've got to figure out more clearly what we want students to be able to do. Because if, uh, in the classic, in the grammar class, classic, one classic pedagogy is to give a list of 10 sentences and say, correct the subject verb agreement errors in these 10 sentences. Did you do it? Yeah, everyone's done that. So it's fun, right? And you're like, oh, I'm so great. I can correct 10 subject verb agreement problems. But once you're confronted with a sort of messy, noisy, Thing that you, and reading your own work, woo, and then it all falls apart. So there has to be something beyond like getting the answer right. It ha the, lang the language work that we do has to be for something other than getting the answer right. There's also these sort of fun things to do, with sentence combining activities, where you get a series of like short weird sentences, and then you combine them into a long weird sentence. <laughs> and again, it shows wonderful, like woo. I know where to put my subordinating conjunction, but it doesn't, it's not particularly communicatively efficient because it doesn't really do anything that anyone would want to do. Um, I can show you examples of things. Um, so what I'm suggesting is in a, a grammar class is useful and it's important um, because it shows that understanding grammar and how it works uh, is integral, integral to a demonstration of linguistic expertise. <laughs> Like it's right in the nitty gritty of showing 
that you can manipulate language for your own purposes, rather than something being overlaid at the end, and that's one of the real issues that we have in the class, like doing grammar from when you're writing the first sentence, like doing it and figuring out what you're actually doing is much harder than the, I've got to fix all the comma splices. I mean, comma splices. Um, but not writing them in the first place, much harder. <laughs> Um, so we want to go beyond this grammar as a veneer of respectability and think of it as a real understanding of what we're doing with language. So in, in a sense I'm arguing for a broader definition of grammar. What that you don't, when you read introduction to grammar and syntax, we try to do that by adding in syntax and saying, oh, it's not just apostrophes. Um, but it's still, the, the word grammar, even though it's sexy, it has an image problem because it is considered this veneer of respectability that you do at the end, like you fix stuff, rather than it being something that is uh, you work with and that becomes part of your understanding of what you're doing linguistically. So, so I, by imagining this community, I'm trying to change the landscape, so we think of linguistic performance, what we actually show, is more valuable than who, what group we say we belong to, or any group that someone else tells us we belong to as well. Of course, we can belong to a lot of linguistic groups. So, okay. so how do we get there? So the first suggestion is we teach grammar generatively. And this term generatively like, is an old popular linguistics term. It says instead of um, instead of talking about what we've already done, like examining what we've already done, we figure out how we do it. So this is what I was saying before. When we teach grammar as something productive, as something that's incorporated into the process of writing. So it's not a series of rules to learn. We know the rules already, as in how to say, how to say a sentence that makes sense. You know that. You know what your subject is. You don't know it's called a subject. It's got a subject. It's got a verb. So, so we talk, like Grandpa is about talking about terminology. It's a series of actions to take. It's some choices to make when you're, and, and people who are experienced in professional writers do this automatically. But in the grammar, in the grammar classes, we have an opportunity to make this ex, like the process of experienced and talented writers explicit to say. Here's some choices that you can make to have different effects. So again, going for communicative efficiency rather than something that looks beautiful and doesn't do very much. And we can, as teachers, we can model the shift we want students to make from thinking of their language as a deficiency, that their, their child-like home language as a deficiency, to thinking of resources they can draw on that, that demonstrate alternatives. So these all our students here and incidentally at a lot of the institution at a lot of the institutions that offer grammar courses are very diverse institutions that have a lot of first generation students. So that's a whole different talk about the social construction of grammar. Okay. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is to show the application of language that goes beyond um, an academic one. So we can adopt a service learning model. So I, I thought about this in particular with the journalism students. But what if we actually started using the grammar course to work on the texts that they're producing for the newspaper? Um, in a few years ago, one of the social work professors had a great big workshop getting students to write texts that were appropriate for social work. So. Um, these, these choices show what different writers in different contexts, professional or otherwise, have to make. So, you know, the choice that you make as a journalist about where to put your a verb may be different to what you do as a social, social worker. And if we're teaching this narrow target, we miss that variability that's built into, um, that's built into the nature of grammar. Like, there isn't one right answer. Right? It's maddening, you can say. Don't use I in your writing. But how are you going to say what you think? <laughs> so, making the context explicit makes the variability in what counts as correct. So we're looking at 
something counting as correct, not being inherently correct or incorrect. So to finish off, I want to come back to our friend Pierre Bourdieu, who says, just at the level of relations between groups, a language is worth what, what those who speak it are worth. So too, at the level of interactions between individuals, <coughs> speech always owes a major part of its value to the value of the person who utters it. So I've tried to suggest today some ways of getting speakers to value themselves a little bit more. Um, so rather than saying that uh, people are worth what their language is worth, to say that what, what you is right, that the language is worth what the speakers are worth. So what we can do in a grammar class and language focused classes in general is to figure out ways to value our speakers more. that 
includes, you know, getting your, like, making sure your antecedents and pronouns agree, unlike mine. Um, so, yes, and it's complicated, which is a terrible answer, but yeah, it's a good point. And uh, this is what I hear from a lot of students, that, like, it really helps because it's the first place on campus where people actually are forced to see what they do on the sentence level. So in that sense, absolutely, yes. I think um, one of the things that strikes me is when you when you learn grammar um, and syntax and what it is, it gives you more choices mm -hmm. about what you do. Right. Because you're, you, it makes you conscious of what you're doing. Like if you just write a sentence and you don't think about, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. You have no way. It's like it's like watching a football game and not knowing the rules of football, right? right? You mm -hmm. might as well just these guys running around on the field that would be crazy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do kind of understand the structures and the syntax, right. it enables you to enjoy the plays much more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, that once you actually know what's going on, then you can think, what choices do I have in my disposal? <coughs> and if someone says, I want you to, uh, like, I'm observing a journalism class. Subject verb agreement. So you want the subject to be first in the sentence. If you don't know what the subject is, it's really hard to put it first in the sentence. So even at that level, just having the terminology available and understanding how it applies to your writing is immensely useful. So I think it, I when I started teaching this course, I was like, why though do we have a grammar course in college? Because you know, not that I had any grammar when I was in school, but I did except in French. Um, but then, as I've taught the course, I thought, this is a really important thing to do. This is the only place we spend a semester fo focusing on the sentence level and getting students to do this really detailed technical work. And it is technical, and that's very shocking for a lot of students that it's like really detail oriented. Oh. I want to say I really enjoyed your presentation oh. today. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, and as a musician and, and as an improviser, I'm constantly thinking, how do we teach something like improvisation? And I can only see parallels with what you're talking about, because you don't want someone to replicate exactly what you're doing. I love that idea of putting these sentences together and creating a new sentence, not teaching the skills you need to, to learn. Um, and I really like the idea of, of this uh, accessing diversity and, and, and context and things like that. Would you, I, this is the way I'm thinking about improvisation when you want people to stitch things together in a way that, that it, the ideas are communicated. I mean, you're talking about delivery of ideas, mm -hmm. right? So do you ever dig deeper into the process? I mean, it's, I know it's form versus function here, but you're talking about writing clear sentences, mm -hmm. but sometimes I worry that that's putting the cart in front of the horse. Mm -hmm. I mean, is the Orwellian idea of thinking and, and, and writing are the same thing. Right. I, I was wondering if you could talk about thinking about good writing. Well, I, mean, I think that, that good writing is something that does what its author wants it to do and the, and the audience gets that. So I didn't come out of an English program, but I know in English program there's a, programs there's a lot of emphasis on writing like beautiful prose and actually it delays people finishing their dissertations because they think their dissertations aren't, aren't beautiful enough. This is a problem in America. Um, but, so I mean, I think good writing is functional writing. And you, it, there's nothing that's objectively good, um, and there's, I mean, there's nothing that's objectively bad. It doesn't do what it needs to do. So, I, I think the analogy with improvisation is interesting because with improvisation, people have to have the basic tools already. Like you can't improvise if you don't know how to play your instrument. And so. This is similar in the sense that people know how to speak and use language already, and I think that's one of the challenges of speaking any, teaching any kind of linguistics, is that you're working against what people already know without having thought about it. Um, so, and a grammar course and, and a writing co course is useful in the sense, if, if it can make explicit what people take for granted. And so what you're trying to do in improvisation is absolutely Make explicit what people feel, and yet, you know, they like, can't yet do, and so it's all sort of bundled up together. And I think um, there's a, there's a lot to like when you're good at writing, it is rather like improvisation. Like you just know what to do, when to do it. 
but you need to know the forms. You need to know the structures beforehand. And I think when they took grammar instruction out of elementary schools and high schools, people didn't know what they were working with. And it made life much harder for people to adapt their writing to a particular context. It just became a big mess of words. Well, I think a really interesting collaboration would be to have a jazz sentence improvisation <laughs> uh, your organization, which is a combination of jazz improvisation mm -hmm. and sentence improvisation. It's like spoken word jazz. Next performance. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of the same skills, yeah. right? It's taking mm -hmm. things you know and rearranging them into something new that still works. Right. And I think people, linguistically, people are a lot better at doing that than they think they are. And so this is like I'm not saying it right. And you know, when you're in grad school and you're making presentations, you write them out. You have to be some years out before you're like, okay, I guess I can just talk. So <laughs> or never. It's all. Yeah, I want also want to thank you for an incredibly sexy lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but um, I think when you start to think about it, um, Grammar is really, and language, is really one of the last vestiges of um, imperialism, mm -hmm. and one mm -hmm. of the least challenged, probably, mm -hmm. too. Um, and why am I saying that is, is because, as you rightly said in, in, in the beginning, notions about competence, authority, you're very personal, who you are as a person, but deeply tied up in how you use language and how you're able to massage and, and, and manipulate language. Um, and I, so, so I was very intrigued by it when you um, said there's research out there that um, talks about the if, um, communicatively efficient speaker and says that the non-native the non English speaker is actually more successful uh, in, in, ter in that term, in, in, in terms of being um, communicati communicatively efficient. And it seems to me really that uh, to be efficient, you have to be able to straddle different Englishes, if you want, a different grammatical levels, if you yeah. wish, for lack of a better um, okay. terminology. Um, and, and so, so I was wondering if, there, if you could talk a little bit more uh, about that research, or if there's other research that it's, it's, it's very much connected to people who've done all of those colonial stuff in class. I need to take a course in schools. <laughs> 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 this, this, this World English class, these ladies and gentlemen have come from, we're actually examining like the, the close connections between imperialism and what people consider their linguistic competence to be. But uh, um, the literature that I was referring to is it's fairly new because bef uh, in the past it's, there's always been the assumption that it's best to be a native speaker, but what we're seeing in the world is that um, there are many people using English in particular, but language generally, who use it every day and are very successful language users in the sense that they do what they want, but they don't do very well in class because they're being held to the standard of this this native speaker competence, which doesn't like it doesn't do anything for them. Like if they if they have some subject verb agreement problems because the languages that they do speak natively don't have subject verb agreement. I mean it doesn't impair what they're actually communicating, but it looks really bad if you're reading it. Um, I mean, the imperialist part doesn't yeah. absolve you from being able to to, to command no. the grammar in certain contexts. Right, like and but that's um, the thing, that sort of the imperialist part mm -hmm. set up one right. standard that said this is what you need Absolutely. to attain, and if you don't attain it, then you're the problem. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is yours as well, because we gave it to you. This is, <laughs> this is, we, gave, we gave you the language, now it's your your opportunity to use it. This is happening in India and the Caribbean and everywhere like that. that, that and so you place standard British English that was at the center and say this is the commodity in which with which you will be we will measure success. And if you if you don't meet that standard, you're not successful. So what the post colonial period has done is have people sort of dilute that centrality and say, Yeah, yeah, we can do that. But we're going to do these other things as well. We're going to incorporate these other languages into it. But these are like a lot in the Car in the Caribbean and India. There are people who still identify as native speakers, who maybe from you know the the, the language teachers say, oh no, no, it's not a native speaker. 
but they're identifying as native speakers. So that's this other group of people who are bilingual native speakers who may well have been excluded from the native speaker fold. And then you've got this third, it's called the expanding circle um, of this English as a foreign language where people are using it all the time, but it's a functional language rather than something that even people like to say, oh yeah, that's my language. Say, no, that's the language I'm using to do this thing. So it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. John. Yeah, I think that, that a lot of times you, you get uh, what you might call the sort of uh, rigidified native speaker uh, who uh, basically, if, you're, if your accent diverges at all, they say, oh, I, I, you know, I can't understand the, the TA or something like that. You get, you, you get a lot of things like that. And the prob and and you know that uh, not only does that that cause problems when they're uh, at, at the university, but when they get out in the world, uh, you can't send a person like that on an international uh, into an international situation, uh, and they're going to be limiting themselves to uh, to certain contexts. They can't you know they don't have the uh, sort of uh, multilingual or multidialectical flexibility. Uh, which uh, which is increasingly um, a necessity if you're going to uh, operate in any kind of international or global situation, which is increasingly all situations. And so, you know, the the, the native speakers think of themselves as a kind of advantaged class, and in some ways uh, they are. Uh, but they but they but the very rigidity of that uh, can uh, can be limiting in a in a world in which. Um, more people, uh, many more people, uh, speak English uh, as a second language or a third language or a fourth language uh, than as a first language. So I had this funny experience when I started graduate school in, in New Jersey. That my class was made up of me, three Koreans, and three Germans. <coughs> and the Korean woman said, I can't understand you. <laughs> and it was very shocking to me. It was coming from Australia, where everyone, we grew up in a very sort of Englishly diverse place. That we had lots of English, like British English and Scottish English and American English. So I thought I was doing great. And then this woman said to me, "I, I can't understand what you're saying." So I had this this real like being a native speaker was not particularly useful because no one could understand what I was saying. And in this group of three Germans, two, three Koreans, and me, um, no, it was one Singaporean guy who spoke five languages. <laughs> including English. So I was just like, I'm a bit hopeless as the native English speaker here. It was only useful in giving judgments in the, in the linguistic classes. But my judgments were different from everyone anyway, because everyone else was American. Mm -hmm. No, you can't say that. I just did. <laughs> so, anyway. Yes? I guess it goes back to what you were saying about versatility versus expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, the real value is versatility. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, we're, we're catching up to that, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're there yet. And, and a quick question, how old is this term language user? Looking at language as software and its portability is <laughs> what you're talking about. Can this language be ported to another system? Mm -hmm. it, is it know. 10 years old, 20 years old? I, I think it's old? probably fairly, fairly new. But well, I, I think language user uh, was, I think was first, first started to be used in the, in the 90s, yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in, the, in the context of uh, linguistic multi-competence and things No, I like that. never interrogated that term as a language user. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Like software users. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's a module. Anyway. I noticed you didn't really talk about the idea of academic English versus mm -hmm. more colloquial English. And, and I'm just interested that that didn't come up in the discussion at all, because I think it does often when we talk about this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I'm also interested in, in my own classroom that I'm typically teaching one particular genre of writing and trying to get it done. Like, how can you be competent in this one? Because I teach in physician assistant programs, so they have to be able to co communicate in a medical world, which is a whole separate sub language. Um, but then sometimes I worry about the students that may aspire to go on to graduate school who we're not really dealing with what you have to be able to write for graduate school. That's a different kind of writing for that, too. It's sort of interesting because I've been thinking a lot about what we're doing in, in writing 300 um, in particular because that's meant to immerse students simultaneously in academic language broadly but also something disciplinary, disciplinary language. So 
I, I sort of avoided academic language because it's very amorphous and we, we in freshman composition, I'm very vexed about this, but in freshman writing, in first year writing, we sort of treat it as this, again, this like unmoving target, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's, it's, it's complicated to say what our expectations of ac academic writing are. And from our perspective, it's difficult because we're sort of exporting students. We're saying they have competence in academic writing, but then they get into uh, you know, bio 101 or bio 201. And they, they, it's a completely different set of expectations. Mm -hmm. So we do have to think about like what that means. What 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 can we take of this sort of amorphous thingy academic writing and say yes, these are the things that students need to know. And I mean, citation's a big one. I think we've agreed that citation's important. But beyond that, I'm not. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> oh, that's. I mean, one of the questions is, is, is there such a thing as academic writing in general, or are there simply, you know, I mean, you, you gave the example of, of, you know, physician assistant discourse, medical discourse, um, are there just a series of these various, these various uh, sub-discourses, I mean, in, in some ways, um, uh, you know, English 125, writing 300 are, are all premised on the on, on the idea that there is something in common, that right. there that there is something that uh, you can call uh, economic writing. But not everyone agrees that that is that 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 is the case. I mean, there are some there there are some institutions, uh, uh, at Cornell, for example, they that all they have are freshman seminars. They call them that are in the discipline. There's no such thing as uh, composition because the theory is that um, you know there, there's no such th there, that that decontextualized um, uh, academic language is uh, is really not you know it, it's just artificial and it, it doesn't really exist. Student questions. Uh, no, the only other thing I find is interesting is we're all staying on the professional academic language conversation. <coughs> And you mentioned imperialism, but you also brought up that this is also a very capitalistic viewpoint in the sense of uh, people are commodities, and yep. so their language is part of who they are as commodities. And so I just wanted to turn it on its head a little bit and say, you know, one of the things that's being devalued here are the, per are the personal and the private spheres right. and the, the ways where you connect the relations that you have with people, with family, with community, because, because the language that we're that we're aiming for is it makes us also aim for the values of capitalism. Mm -hmm. if we, if we accept that we must aim for that language. Right. And so linguists have this problem of talking about language, not people and speakers sometimes. Um, Chuck. Um, first of all, in my class, I'm going to get you for not asking questions when this is going. We've been talking. You shouldn't let the professors only talk. You should, you should ask your questions. Um, there are several tensions, you, you mentioned the tension model, and there are several tension models that popped into my head. Uh, the, the, um, when I call someone, help me with my computer problems, and I get someone in India who's, who's, who's uh, efficient but not proficient, mm -hmm. one of the reasons for that is they can pay him a whole lot less money, mm -hmm. or her a whole lot less money than mm -hmm. they would following on, on uh, your point and your point. They can pay this person a whole lot less money than they would have to pay someone who's communicatively proficient. So the, the, the matter of, of, of proficiency is, is it's, it's, it floats, as, as you said earlier. Uh, in, in, in the United States, for example, it's, it's middle class women in general who score much higher on the standardized language tests. You look around your college, there are more women than men. So when it comes to, to the language, women generally perf outperform men. Yet, and, you know, if you look at the New York Times two weeks ago, there's this, these four women who are corporate execs and everybody else is still battling the, the, battling the, the glass ceiling. So then that pr makes a tension between, with me and as a teacher, because I must deliver, I'm part of this delivery system too. I must deliver, I must deliver what my students perceive they need, even if I don't agree that they need it. If, if, it's, if, if I must deliver what I perceive that they need, so I, I do this in some kind of way that that kind of balances, that kind of compromises, while at the same time in a class like sociolinguistics, we talk about this kind of thing openly. Mm -hmm. You know, what's accent, what's, 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 what's uh, acceptable, you know, um, uh, what, is generally, what is generally not acceptable. 
but um, there's a series of tensions. And then uh, finally, uh, James Baldwin, and um, if black English isn't a language, then tell me what is, says the, the question is never about language. The question is about how language is used. So this is this manipulation of power and, and identity. Uh, uh, and our identity is not just chosen by us, it's imposed on us by other people. So it's, it's, it's almost never just the grammar of the language itself. Right. It's what the language is used for in terms of human interactions. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like me, you're not going to like my language. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think I'm worth anything, you're not going to think my language is worth anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't contribute something, and putting my language is not, not useful to the world. But that's, I sort of want to go back a little bit to Cindy's, Cindy's point about this, this all has very sort of economic ramifications, and that's why I didn't talk very much about that, but that's where this whole project started, thinking about like what what can what can we do to, you know, to acknowledge even the fact that students at least perceive this class as doing something for their jobs, um, whereas we're in sort of like this disconnected land of academia saying, oh, we're teaching because it's like English 270 is a liberal arts course, grammar is a liberal art. I mean, yeah, no. Um, so it's, it's, I'm trying to tease out this, the, the implications of this sort of globalized economy that we do devalue local connections because we want workers to be interchangeable. And the easiest way to get them to be interchangeable is to make their language interchangeable. Because then you don't even need a person behind it. You can just, well, you don't need to talk to a person, you will just have a phone bank. You know, as long as there's some kind of communication, that's fine. But it, it really, it, it devalues anything that is idiosyncratic. Just bringing back the music, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I was thinking about what everyone's been saying, and, and I'm thinking about one of the languages that make the most money right now, hip-hop lyrics. That's a, a very advanced set of codes. And I don't want to open up another whole thing here, but you know, it's, it seems like we're creating, to get back to your phone bank analogy, this thing that was very, very user-friendly, very, very modular, very good, and then something on the other extreme, like hip-hop, which is very particular. Well, there's actually some applied linguistics literature on the language of hip-hop and how, how it's proven to be quite exportable that it, it, it's flexible enough to be, that it can be adopted by local rappers and artists, and they change the sort of, the codes to suit the local context. So it's, it's even though it is, it's very intricate, it's adaptable because it has this message of the key, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna sound like a dog, so the keeping it real message is, it's really university. Uh, universal, and that's what's been made really popular, and that's sort of helped it spread across the world. But then, you know, hip hop in Malaysia, you don't talk about women in that way, and so that part has been sort of taken out, and, and other parts of the code and what's what's and talking about bling, yes, I'm like a dog. Um, it's uh, you don't do that. That's vulgar. But there's enough in the sort of in the, the whole code that had made it very adaptable internationally. So it's interesting. Well, we really want to think economically, though, since the hip hop artists make the most money, mm -hmm. we really should we be not teaching introduction to grammar. We should be teaching introduction to grammar. You should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 no. Well, I'm just thinking about it. In, in, in my English 270, the first assignment we do is with song lyrics because they're actually really nice to look at. They, they strip out a lot of the complex sentences and you can find subjects mm. and verbs really easily. Um, and students feel like they're choosing something, which they are. So it, I always say, no Celine Dion, they're very boring. <laughs> they're so boring. Like, you got teaching them? Well, I was saying, um, like how you say we should be teaching, I know you say a joke, but I'm saying we teach, you know, you don't know, have to teach us because right. we teach ourselves. We, mm -hmm. When we're speaking amongst friends, it's not something you learn in school, it's something you learn on the streets. But and that's sort of the point of hip hop, right? Like, right, it's yeah. not a, you know, and it's how many one in a million people mm -hmm. make it, you know, right. mm -hmm. as hip hop artists. It's, it's, it's interesting because it is, it's like, it, it, it's language that connects on a personal level, but the people who have been successful 
are huge global, hugely wealthy. So they've translated, managed to translate this local connection into something gigantic and very lucrative. Um, and doesn't really care about small people at all. It's like multi mega conglomerate kind of things. So it's this really interesting contrast between <coughs> the, the appeal of the music and the effect by capitalism. Yeah, everyone can't be left with us. Small people need to learn proper. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I need support here. Yes. But um, like when she was talking just now, like all I kept thinking about was the fact that um, there's a difference between formal and informal learning. Yeah. So like when I think hip hop, like lyrics, I think of like an informal mm -hmm. learning. That's what I, that's the way they write their lyrics is kind of like how I would speak to my friend outside mm -hmm. of school right. when we're just on the street and we're just talking and we're not thinking about what verb to use. You know, we're not thinking about the syntax of the sentences versus when you're in a formal setting like school you are learning the syntax and so I don't know like they to me they're like two separate worlds but then they like somehow well, come together so they they, mix, yeah. they've got really I mean they're really, you, if I said like if I if we taught it in class and I got something wrong we'd be like you can't do that in hip hop so they're really <laughs> like you just can't do it like that um, so there are really strong linguistic rules, that they're just not explicit, and I think one of the, sort of reading this stuff about the international spread of hip hop, one of the things about it is, it's meant to be authentic, and as soon as you take it out of that context, you make it inauthentic, and then it defeats the whole purpose of hip hop, so it has to be rooted in this com local community, so like transnational hip hop doesn't, doesn't really fly. Well, it gets back to this idea of membership, right? Yeah, exactly. Authenticity. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which so you, you need to. You, it's like keeping it real. That you can't like if you, it's in class, it's like absolutely not real. It's odd. Um, so that and it, it's not authentic hip hop, and because it's not meant to be this object of analysis, it's it's meant to be more visceral than that. And then once you put something in a classroom, you take the. It's very hard to retain the emotional impact of something, and that's why. Teaching literature is really hard because if you <laughs> make someone read things that they really, really love and analyze it, they get very sad. <laughs> That's why, you know, I told the students don't choose a song that you absolutely adore because then you're going to pull it apart and you may <laughs> not be able to listen to it ever again in your life. So if you need to be able to listen to that, so I said the was perhaps good, um, you need to be able to listen to that, don't choose it. So I had a lot of carry underwood as well. Just so Okay, so now are you saying? Are we closing? Yes. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hannah.